Recently, I've become increasingly puzzled. It seems any individual from China feels entitled to speak for the entire nation. Not long ago, a young man named Mao Xinghou sued the writer Mo Yan on behalf of all Chinese people, demanding Mo Yan pay one yuan in compensation to each citizen. And now, a Chinese resident in Russia has made a public statement on behalf of all Chinese people, which includes inappropriate comments about military deployment. Let's take a look at the video. No matter what difficulties Russia encounters, the Chinese people always stand with Russia. I hope the Chinese military will deploy soon and defeat Western countries. If France and NATO send troops, China will also send troops. China and Russia will together defeat NATO and France. The video of a Chinese person's controversial remarks gained attention amid a wave of recent terrorist violence in Russia. On March 22, a mass shooting at Crocus City Hall near Moscow resulted in over 140 deaths and many injuries. A 15-year-old Chinese student known as Wang witnessed the attack while attending a concert with a Russian girl, who tragically died. Another student, Chini Ming, experienced the terror while at a mall nearby, where he first mistook an explosion for a drone strike, before realizing it was a shooting. The incident caused panic among the local Chinese community, some of whom considered buying bulletproof vests. The aftermath saw a profiteering surge with exorbitantly priced one-way flight tickets from Russia to China, reflecting a broader pattern of exploitation faced by Chinese individuals in Russia. Examples include being overcharged for transportation, additional charges for hotel stays, and discrimination against Chinese tour guides. These experiences highlight the systemic xenophobia in Russia, as illustrated by personal anecdotes from 2017, where police and customs officials exploited Chinese citizens for money. A troubling situation arose for Chinese citizens in Russia when they were subjected to a visa rule anomaly that only allowed a three-day stay, contrary to the official exemption from visa requirements. This led to detentions and demands for payment by Russian customs, leaving many stranded. Amidst this, a recent terrorist attack near Moscow exacerbated fears within the Chinese community, particularly affecting businessmen due to attend or participating in trade exhibitions. One exhibitor, M. Chung, highlighted the proximity of the attack to their location and the resulting impact on the exhibition, with concerns over reduced attendance and queries on social media about the viability of continuing plans to travel to Russia. The attack led to the cancellation of an exhibition at the Expo Center, nullifying significant financial investments and compounding the difficulties Chinese businesses were already facing. In the chaos, accommodation became scarce, prompting Mr. Young, a homestay owner in Moscow, to offer aid to stranded exhibitors. However, the Chinese Communist Party's CCP response to these incidents has been criticized for its lack of support, contrasting with its claim to always back its citizens. This was evident during the Russia-Ukraine conflict when Chinese students were left to fend for themselves. The CCP's lack of support extends to the international mockery of the Chinese embassy's efforts, such as the distribution of expired gifts, which has led to ridicule on social media. Furthermore, the CCP has been active in surveillance and intimidation of overseas Chinese students who voice dissent. Students have reported being followed, receiving mysterious calls, and facing pressure from Chinese authorities, affecting their families back home. Despite this pressure, Chinese students have found a new sense of political awareness and community among like-minded individuals abroad. Concerns have grown regarding the CCP's influence in UK universities, with reported incidents of academic freedom being compromised due to commercial interests, highlighting a complex and often intimidating environment for Chinese nationals abroad. In Jiangsu, a high-tech company has innovated a unique high-tech way of compensation. Newly hired employees are not paid a salary for the first four months, but earn points instead, with a day's work worth 100 points. Accumulating 3,000 points allows for an exchange into salary. This leaves no days off, and particularly in shorter months like February, it's impossible to amass the required points. To delay the salary exchange, the company devised a scheme where the longer you wait to exchange points, the more salary you receive. For instance, exchanging in the second month gets you 1.1 times the salary, and by the 11th month, it doubles. The cap is set at 36 months, where the exchange rate hits 2.5 times the salary. However, it's a catch-22 as the company can manipulate its finances to prevent salary exchange indefinitely. This cunning strategy questions the integrity of the high-tech company, proposing a cynical view of corporate tactics. To top it off, there are prerequisites for exchanging points for salary, 
including the company's profitability and the cash flow being able to support the exchange without impacting operations, making the exchange of points for salary virtually impossible under regular financial management. This paints a grim picture of a system designed to exploit rather than reward employees. Beijing is like a ghost town these days. The malls are empty, and it's hard to find anyone out and about on weekends. Places that used to be packed with people now sit deserted. China's economy is in a slump, and Beijing's is rapidly declining. Even Guajia, once bustling with activity late into the night, now closes up before nine. It's like the streets are deserted, with pedestrians almost floating through the air. Once vibrant restaurants now line up rows of empty plastic chairs, and even the wide streets of Dongzimen are eerily empty. It feels like New Year's Eve, but without the festivities. Even the famous Sanlatan is now desolate. Beijing residents lament the stark contrast from the past, where students, migrants, and young workers were drawn to the city. The environment and location of this particular shop are still excellent, but there's hardly anyone around. Tourists visiting Beijing reminisce about the bustling World Trade Center, now a shadow of its former self. The overall business environment is bleak, with many shops closing down. It's a tough situation for small businesses, especially in the food industry. There's a wave of closures happening in various retail stores across the country. Being the first membership store in Shanghai, Metro China's Hutai Road store has now closed its doors, leaving many card-holding customers feeling bewildered. The Metro Hutai Road store, which opened in November 2022, suddenly closed for renovations. Over two months have passed, and there's still no further news. Amid the uncertainty, Ms. Shui, a Shanghai resident, is considering cancelling her membership, but she's disappointed that she'll only get a partial refund of her 199 yuan membership fee. As China's economy continues to decline and consumer purchasing power sharply decreases, industries are engaging in fierce price wars, leading to a wave of store closures nationwide. Since mid-October 2023, Following Alibaba's subsidiary, Hema Fresh's announcement to launch a comprehensive supply chain optimization, more and more retail companies have joined the trend of discounting. In the first six months of 2023, 106 Carrefour supermarkets controlled by Suning.com Holdings ceased operations. In December of the same year, Carrefour China closed its first supermarket in Shanghai, Tsuyong Store. According to incomplete statistics, from January 2023 to the present, at least 13 RT Mart stores have closed or announced closures, affecting several provinces including Hunan, Jiangsu, Hubei, and Sichuan. RT Mart is a large chain retail store from Taiwan. The closure and renovation of the Baoshan Metro membership store means uncertain times ahead. The days of enjoying free parking at Ryugwang while shopping at Metro are now just memories. This physical mega-supermarket in Ningbo has finally closed, and the scene on-site is unbearable to witness. The Yiwu old labor market back in the day was truly a bustling scene, with crowds of people jostling to find work. Similarly, in Iwu, Zhujiang, the labor market is swamped with hopeful job seekers, all converging in hopes of finding employment opportunities. To those contemplating the journey to Iwu, Zhujiang, it's advisable to think twice. The situation there is already strained, and the influx of additional seekers will only compound the challenges faced by those already struggling to secure work. Guangzhou Labor Market Service Center In the midst of China's economic downturn, there's a surge of job seekers flocking to the Guangzhou Labor Market Service Center, all eager to land a job. However, upon their arrival, they are met with a harsh reality check, there are simply no job opportunities available. The disappointment and frustration in the air are palpable, especially for migrant workers who lack the means to return home. It's truly disheartening to witness individuals being emotionally crushed by the grim realization of their situation. After traveling from Gansu to Ningxia to find a job, it's been five days, and I still haven't had any luck. I've run out of money, and I don't know what to do next. March is almost over, and I'm wondering if everyone's found a job yet. I'm still struggling. They say March and April are the best times to find work, but I've been to a few job fairs and haven't had any luck. It's not that I'm being too picky. It's just that there aren't many options out there. Besides washing dishes, delivering packages, or working as a security guard or cleaner, are these the only jobs available for people like us in our middle years? I refuse to believe it. Some compare me to the character in Kong Eiji who won't give up his old clothes. I find that comparison hard to accept. I come from the countryside, and my parents have high hopes for me. They see me as their pride and joy. 
After all the years of studying, facing unemployment after just a decade of work and switching from a desk job to manual labor is tough to swallow. It feels like all those years of education were wasted. If I had known, I would have started working sooner. There's a saying that says you can't hire a laborer with 3,000 yuan, but you can hire a college graduate. And it's often true, the college grads rely on the laborers who support them. Sometimes I wonder, what's wrong with our society? Are we not working hard enough? Are we not ambitious or diligent enough? In February, the youth unemployment rate in China rose once again, another sign of China's slow economic recovery. According to data released by the National Bureau of Statistics on March 20, the unemployment rate for urban 16- to 24-year-olds, excluding students, was 15.3% in February, an increase of 0.7% since January. The National Bureau of Statistics of China previously announced on March 18 that the National Urban Survey unemployment rate for February was 5.3%, up 0.1 percentage points from January. Last year, the Chinese government suspended the publication of youth unemployment rate data, citing the need to optimize survey statistics. The statistical method of the Chinese Communist Party to obtain the unemployment rate is rather unique, it only counts registered unemployed individuals with urban household registration, and those who are not registered are not counted as unemployed. Earlier economic data released by the National Bureau of Statistics showed continued economic recovery, with officials claiming comprehensive overexpectation with steady growth. Regarding unemployment rates relevant to the public, Lu Hua, spokesperson and chief economist of the National Bureau of Statistics, stated that favorable factors for promoting employment stability continue to accumulate. The government strengthens policies and measures to promote youth employment and optimizes employment and entrepreneurship guidance services. Despite the optimistic signals from the authorities, many netizens on Weibo remain unconvinced. They argue that the unemployment rate only counts those who have registered as unemployed and excludes those who haven't, suggesting discrepancies in the data. They emphasize the importance of observing real-life situations rather than relying solely on statistics. Zhang Qing, a Shanghai youth who graduated from a 985 university in June last year, stated that he can only rely on flexible employment as he cannot find satisfactory formal employment. He expressed his helplessness, stating that he should be included in the unemployment statistics, but if people like him were all considered unemployed, the government's reputation might suffer. For Zhang Qing and others claiming to be part of the unemployed population, regardless of changes in statistical methods or optimized data, the reality is that young people cannot find ideal jobs, leading them to embrace a lying flat lifestyle as a do-nothing youth. Under a long-term sense of despair about the future, posts about do-nothing youth have been circulating on WeChat moments, listing specific lying flat behaviors such as not getting married, not having children, not buying houses, and not investing in the stock market. Zhang Qing joked that while the official emphasis is on economic stability and growth, the younger generation is stable and lying flat and reluctant to stand up. According to statistics from the Chinese Ministry of Education, the number of graduates from regular colleges and universities in China is estimated to reach 11.79 million in 2024, a new high, indicating greater employment pressure this summer. Calvin Lam, a senior Chinese economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics in the UK, stated in written correspondence with Voice of America that China sees approximately 10 to 12 million graduates enter the job market each year. In previous years of good economic growth, private and state-owned enterprises could provide enough job opportunities for them. However, in recent years, with increased regulatory pressure on enterprises and a downturn in the overall economy, it has become increasingly difficult to integrate these new workers into the labor market. The employment landscape mirrors a broader crisis, exemplified by a sweeping wave of closures across various sectors, vividly illustrating the gravity of the economic downturn. Vacant office spaces lining urban streets and a sharp decline in rental rates serve as silent witnesses to the bleakness of our times. The shuttering of once-thriving eateries and stores translates directly into lost job opportunities. Reportedly, during the first half of 2023, China witnessed the closure of a staggering 460,000 businesses and approximately 3 million dining establishments, as per scant figures from mainland media. Economist David Wan, hailing from the United States, cautions that the immense strain on small and micro-enterprises could jeopardize nearly 200 million jobs. These smaller entities, lacking the financial robustness and technological monopolies of their larger counterparts, are particularly vulnerable to economic pressures. Wan further contends that the bankruptcy of these enterprises amid the economic turmoil would have ripple effects, 
impacting both seasoned professionals and fresh entrants to the job market. Such a scenario threatens to sow significant instability within society. Moreover, given that small and micro-enterprises contribute around half of the nation's GDP, their collapse would deal a severe blow to the overall economy. Adding to the woes, the disruption of critical supply chains resulting from these closures is poised to drive up prices, exacerbating the strain on livelihoods and exacerbating economic woes. Forbes China said that the total wealth of the top 100 rich people in China decreased from $907.1 billion last year to 895 billion yuan, a decrease of $12.1 billion. Analysts say that the burst of the real estate bubble, which has long driven economic growth in China, has caused the wealth of high net worth individuals with multiple properties to decline even faster. The withdrawal of foreign capital has also dealt a blow to China's economic growth momentum. Chen Songxing, director of the Center for New Economic Policies at Donghua University in Taiwan, said in an interview with Voice of America that, in addition to the slump in China's consumption after the COVID-19 pandemic, companies facing weak consumer demand are unwilling to invest and recruit, resulting in a very high youth unemployment rate. Weak consumption and private investment in China have led to deflation, making it even more difficult for families and businesses to repay their debts, further exacerbating the pressure and becoming an inescapable vicious cycle. He said, of the three drivers of China's economy, exports, consumption, and investment, the only one that has performed relatively well is exports. China's General Administration of Customs announced a 7.1% year-on-year increase in the total value of exports in the first two months of this year, but this is due to deflation, resulting in a decline in export prices and a large amount of dumping abroad. He believes that this part may also be difficult to sustain, as countries such as Europe, the United States, and Japan have launched anti-subsidy investigations into some of China's major export products, including electric vehicles and solar components, so the role of exports in driving economic growth may also be limited. In recent years, the People's Republic of China has intensified its grip on the economic freedoms of both its citizens and foreign investors, implementing measures that drastically curtail individuals' ability to access their own money. In China, bank transfers require the owner of the account to be presented. An 80-year-old man with limited mobility was tied to a chair and carried into the bank. Because of this ridiculous requirement, many families must take their elders to the bank to withdraw money before they die. This tightening control manifests through a spate of regulations and restrictions, painting an increasingly bleak picture of financial autonomy within the nation. The implementation of these stringent controls reflects a broader trend of authoritarian oversight and highlights the Chinese government's prioritization of state control over individual liberty and market freedom. This dire situation was exacerbated by a series of high-profile system failures that crippled the operations of behemoth banks like the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, and the China Construction Bank, CCB. In December 2022 alone, disruptions affected millions of customers who were left unable to access their accounts or conduct transactions, sowing seeds of distrust and tarnishing the bank's reputations. Compounding these woes is the sobering reality of declining profitability. The six largest Chinese banks collectively earned over 3.7 billion yuan, $537 million, daily in the first half of 2022, but their profit growth rates have plummeted. The ICBC and CCB saw growth rates of just 5 to 6% in 2022, a stark contrast to the 18.7% growth achieved by one bank in 2021. The old man and the family passed away due to illness, leaving behind a deposit of 20,000 US dollars in the bank. However, his children went to the bank to withdraw their money, but were refused and told that they were not eligible. What is the reason behind this? The 20,000 US dollars deposit is the hard-earned money saved by the elderly couple over the years from farming and collecting scrap. Even when they were sick, they didn't use it. But a few months ago, when the old man's condition worsened and he felt he might not last much longer, he called his children and asked them to go to the bank to withdraw the money. However, they encountered all sorts of difficulties. First, they were told that the system was under maintenance and they couldn't withdraw the money. Then, when the maintenance was completed, they were told that the system was facing error and they still couldn't withdraw. This went on until the old man passed away. After that, the bank straight up tells them that their request is impossible. The cause of the control could stand from the crisis of the Chinese banking industry. Data shows China's reserves fell to $3.053 trillion by September 2022, a $45 billion or 1.42% monthly decrease, the largest drop in seven months. 
With external debt ballooning to $2.4 trillion by June 2022, net reserves stood at just over $680 billion US dollars. What's the situation? This. What's the issue with these banknotes not being recognized? They should be recognized, they were all dispensed already. 27 of them cannot be recognized. What's going on? Please retrieve the banknotes that cannot be recognized. What? Still. It cannot be like this. So many. What's going on? Is all of this counterfeit money? Is it all counterfeit? Why is my salary all fake cash? Moreover, flooding markets with fake US dollars threatens the global reserve currency's stability. Experts warn if these bills enter circulation via China's central bank for settlement, it could trigger worldwide financial turmoil as the US aims to maintain its five treasures, military, US dollar dominance, multinationals, technology slash education. The implications are severe. Firstly, it corrodes citizens and the world's trust in Chinese banks managing financial assets. Numerous seizures by U.S. Customs illustrate the scale, within three days in May 2021, officials intercepted 24 packages containing $685,000 in fake dollars from China. In April 2021, over 100 shipments totaling $1.64 million were seized, nearly all originating from China. Furthermore, according to recent data from the World Bank, China's banking sector is grappling with an escalating NPL issue. As of the end of the third quarter of 2023, the Chinese banking sector's NPL ratio stood at 1.65%, with outstanding NPLs reaching 4 trillion yuan or 546.72 billion US dollars, an increase of 183.2 billion yuan or roughly 25.5 billion US dollars from the beginning of the year. Furthermore, listed banks in China reported NPL volumes amounting to 2.13 trillion yuan or roughly 296 billion US dollars in 2023 a reflection of burgeoning credit risk within the sector. This uptick in NPLs is indicative of deteriorating asset quality and presents a systemic risk that could jeopardize the sector's stability. A man in his 70s suddenly fell ill and was rushed to the hospital. His brother, Mr. Jiang, arrived at the hospital only to find out that medication had been stopped due to late payment. He attempted to withdraw money using his brother's bank card but faced numerous obstacles at the bank. Eventually, Mr. Jiang negotiated with the bank to no avail. He suggested the bank directly coordinate with the hospital to expedite the transfer of life-saving funds. He stressed the urgency of the situation. Only after journalist intervention, the bank requested Mr. Jiang provide proof of kinship and have it notarized. Since Mr. Jiang's older brother had no children and was a loner, they sought assistance from the community center. The community center initially hesitated due to regulations prohibiting the issuance of proof of kinship for living relatives. However, they made an exception considering the urgency of the situation and obtained approval to issue the document. But the bank still says no. Starting in 2018, the Chinese government set a precedent for imposing harsh withdrawal limits for all citizens, begin with the introduction of a rule that restricted individuals from withdrawing more than 100,000 renminbi or about 15,530 US dollars annually from foreign countries. This measure, ostensibly aimed at curbing illicit financial flows and maintaining financial stability, has arguably had the dual effect of significantly limiting Chinese nationals' financial autonomy and their ability to participate freely in the global economy. Not only that, the CCP also restricted individual transfer, which caused a lot of anger. Do you understand the bank's actions here? How can the bank unilaterally breach the contract? So the maximum transfer limit is roughly 700 or 1,400 US dollars. You'll have to transfer again tomorrow. This questionable operation has caused great distress to many people. A nationwide movement against transfer limits is unfolding, impacting hundreds of millions. Previously, transferring 7,000 or 14,000 US dollars via mobile was simple, but now banks have capped the limits. If a friend lends you 28,000 US dollars, you'd need 20 years to transfer it all. When you urgently need 14,000 US dollars, the money is right there in your account, but you cannot access it. The banks claim these measures prevent telecommunication fraud. However, this one-size-fits-all approach has caused major inconveniences. Depositors have the right to freely access their funds, how can banks breach this unilaterally? While publicly citing fraud prevention, banks likely have ulterior motives. By limiting transfers, they can keep more deposits in their accounts to earn interest spreads. 
They also force customers to visit branches for paperwork, allowing dormant tellers to re-engage users using a seemingly justifiable pretext to serve their own interests, regardless of the inconvenience caused. Chinese central banks' recent measures to stimulate the economy amidst ongoing challenges such as the return of COVID-19 and internal financial pressures, it's evident that deeper concerns loom within China's financial system. The People's Bank of China, PBOC's decision to slash the reserve requirement ratio, RRR, for banks by 50 basis points as of February 5, freeing up a substantial 1 trillion yuan or 139.8 billion US dollars in long-term capital, was positioned as a boost to the struggling economy. While this action ostensibly aims to spur lending and invigorate economic activities, it inadvertently paints a picture of a system grappling with liquidity fears and wavering investor confidence. If the ability to deposit and withdraw money freely disappears, then what is the meaning of earning money? Recently, a vigorous movement to limit transfers is spreading nationwide, with individual account limits ranging from 700 or 1,400 US dollars. What about the national economy? Recently, I applied for a bank card, but it said that only counter withdrawals are allowed, and non counter transactions are prohibited. Moreover, it's only possible to apply for non counter transactions after three months, and you have to go to the Public Security Bureau's anti fraud center in advance to get approval. The daily online transfer limit is also not granted, said to be part of a card cutting operation. In the future, borrowing and repaying money might require pooling funds from several banks, which is very troublesome. This is one thing. But what if a family member gets sick and needs urgent money for hospitalization? What should we do then? This financial maneuvering arrives amidst an environment of restrictive capital controls that not only affects domestic financial operations, but also how China approaches foreign investments and manages expatriate finances. Despite the semblance of adopting a more open stance towards foreign investments, with cities like Shanghai and Beijing purportedly easing access to funds for foreigners, the reality remains starkly contrasting. The existence of such liberal zones is dwarfed by the extensive web of stringent restrictions and capital controls that prevail nationwide. Chinese banks are the epitome of favoring the rich and powerful while bullying the weak and fearing the strong. State-owned enterprises, SOEs, and central enterprises struggle to borrow money from them. Every day, various documents claim to support small and micro loans, but in reality, it's difficult. If SOEs and central enterprises lend money to each other and end up with bad debts, what happens? What if they lend to private enterprises, and they default? What if they don't repay? The heads of banks are on the line, so there's no choice. This is the reality where the position determines the outcome. The tightening noose of financial repression is further evidenced by reports from Hong Kong, where residents face increasing hurdles in withdrawing funds on the mainland. Instances of extended waiting periods spanning several hours and augmented security measures around banking facilities are not uncommon, planting seeds of concern regarding the economy's stability and a palpable government paranoia over potential capital outflow. The scenario in Hong Kong epitomizes a growing trend of enhanced surveillance and control, igniting fears among the populace and international observers alike. Revealing the insider dealings of a banking system involves the top executives of the bank, such as the CEO and others. They engage in various schemes to make money, with one lucrative method being clandestine loan operations. Through third-party institutions, they seek out borrowers, often referred to colloquially as finding pigs, wherein various assets like houses, cars, and companies are bundled together. These third-party institutions collude with the bank's executives to swiftly acquire funds, leaving the borrower with minimal or even no money while burdened with significant debt. Don't be skeptical about the involvement of bank executives. Incidents of their involvement periodically come to light. Have any high-ranking bank executives been caught? In the face of monetary temptations, is there anything they wouldn't dare to do? When I mention the amounts they could pocket, you will be surprised. It's not just tens or hundreds of thousands, that's petty cash for them. The sums involved are in the tens of millions to billions. The implications are staggering, an entire generation's life savings, pensions, and financial futures held hostage by a cabal of untouchable elites who treat the nation's wealth as their personal slush fund. As the last vestiges of transparency erode, and financial freedoms dwindle to a mere facade, the once unthinkable question looms, has China's banking system become little more than a grand Ponzi scheme, sustained by draconian capital controls and the blind faith of its citizens? Western firms flee China, leaving millions without jobs and facing an uncertain future. According to the latest data from Gallup, 
41% of Americans believe that the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, is the greatest enemy of the United States today, with Russia coming in second at 26%, and Iran closely behind at 9%. There is nothing surprising about this result as this is the fourth consecutive year that Americans have considered the CCP as their top enemy. What is more notable is that Gallup, along with a host of other foreign companies, are withdrawing all operations from China. Gallup, a renowned global polling company, has announced its exit from China. The company, known for its expertise in education and training, disclosed its decision to close its operations in China through a notice to its clients, as reported by the Financial Times. According to the Financial Times, Gallup informed its clients that it would be withdrawing from China, with plans to relocate some ongoing projects overseas and terminate others. The article highlighted the increasing challenges faced by American consulting firms operating in China, attributed to both the country's economic downturn and heightened scrutiny from Chinese security agencies. Recent incidents, including raids and searches targeting American consulting firms like Bain & Company, Mintz Group, and Capvision, have underscored the growing difficulties. The report indicated that Gallup's withdrawal from China is part of a broader trend, with other multinational consulting firms also downsizing their operations in the country. For instance, Forrester Market Consulting, specializing in technology consulting, has laid off a significant portion of its Chinese workforce, while Gerson Lehrman Group initiated layoffs last summer. Not only foreign companies, but even the Netherlands has made a bold move by closing its consulate in Chongqing amidst China's struggle to attract foreign investors. This decision, announced via the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, shifts responsibilities to the Dutch embassy in Beijing for matters concerning Chongqing and its neighboring provinces. The closure follows discussions with foreign business representatives in Chengdu, revealing the limited presence of Dutch businesses in the area. While China's foreign ministry respects the Netherlands' decision, tensions between Beijing and Brussels have heightened due to the Ukraine conflict and trade disputes with Dutch intelligence services expressing concerns about economic security. Additionally, the Dutch government's alignment with U.S. policies aimed at restricting China's access to certain high-tech industries has strained relations further. Notably, Chongqing hosts consulates from only a handful of countries, including Japan, Canada, and Hungary. Recent incidents involving Dutch journalists being barred from covering protests in nearby Sichuan province underscore ongoing challenges faced by foreign media in China. When questioned about these incidents, China's foreign ministry spokesperson reiterated the country's commitment to protecting the rights of foreign journalists. Shortly prior to that, the American e-commerce giant Amazon's announcement of its withdrawal from the Chinese market highlights the vast scale and potential of China's economy. Amazon's decision to exit China undoubtedly reflects the challenging circumstances it faced, indicating a lack of viable prospects for growth and sustainability in the Chinese market. According to available public data, Amazon China peaked with a market share of 15.8% in 2008, its highest point in the Chinese market. However, from 2012 to 2018, its market share steadily dwindled, declining to figures of 2.3%, 2.7%, 1.5%, 1.2%, 1.3%, 0.8%, and eventually 0.6%. As Amazon's e-commerce market share plummeted to 0.6%, Tmall, JD.com, and Pinduoduo emerged as dominant players with market shares of 55%, 25.2%, and 5.7% respectively. This data clearly demonstrates that Amazon China faced fierce competition from these aggressive players in China's e-commerce landscape. Amazon China's space for development contracted, while the triumvirate dominance of Alibaba, JD.com, and Pinduoduo solidified. Above cases are just some of the undergoing global economic landscape in China, which is a seismic shift as Western capital steadily diverts its investments away from China. These shifts represent more than mere diversification, they symbolize a fundamental reassessment of trust and strategic economic interests towards emerging economies like India, Vietnam, the United States, and nations within the European Free Trade Association, EFTA. This mass departure, 
fueled by factors such as escalating labor expenses and apprehensions regarding regulatory uncertainties, has triggered a deep re-evaluation of trust and strategic economic interests. 80% South Korean giants withdraw from China with losses for consecutive years. Since 2023, a staggering 10 global giants, including Canon from Japan, Samsung from South Korea, and Sony from Japan, have abandoned China. This exodus, which also includes Toshiba, Nikon, Amazon, LinkedIn, has seen them relocate their operations to Thailand, the Philippines, or back to their native lands. The fallout is that tens of thousands of Chinese employees are left in limbo. The corporate landscape is ablaze as major South Korean entities make a swift and startling retreat from China. Latte Chemical has severed all ties with Latte Sanjiang Jiaxing Chemical, while LG's new energy has relinquished its hold on Jiangxi wall battery. Samsung SDI, too, has divested its battery assembly operations in Wuxi and Chongqing. Hyundai Motor, not to be outdone, has shed its factories in Beijing and Chongqing, with plans underway to offload its Chongzhou plant this year. Even Hyundai Kia Logistics has liquidated its stake in a joint venture located in Chongzhou. These maneuvers paint a picture of a wholesale exodus of South Korean enterprises from China. Once considered bastions of opportunity and prosperity, foreign companies are now fleeing the Chinese market leaving a trail of uncertainty for the multitude of Chinese workers left in their wake. Is this a mere shift in the winds, or the ominous harbinger of an irreversible decline? Reports from Japanese media sources reveal that Samsung Electronics is poised to halt smartphone production at its Tianjin facility by the year's end. Citing plummeting sales figures, Samsung is forced to shutter operations in the face of dwindling demand. But amidst the gloom, there's a glimmer of hope, while Tianjin faces closure, Samsung's Huizhou factory in Guangdong soldiers on. In a saturated smartphone market, where competition is fierce, Samsung's dwindling market share necessitates a strategic re-evaluation. Nikkei reports confirm that smartphone production at Tianjin will grind to a halt come December 31. The seismic shockwaves of Samsung's retreat from China have ignited a storm of speculation and conjecture. The departure of a global tech titan from such a lucrative market raises eyebrows and questions alike. Yet, this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision, Samsung had been scaling back its Chinese operations since as early as 2018. Their dismal performance in the cutthroat Chinese market, where their market share languished at less than 1% in 2019, left them trailing behind local juggernauts such as Huawei and Xiaomi. But Samsung's exit isn't merely a business decision, it's a tale of geopolitics writ large. The escalating tensions between the United States and China dealt a crushing blow to Samsung's Chinese ambitions. Retaliatory measures imposed by the Chinese government, including bans on chip purchases and stringent sales restrictions, effectively strangled Samsung's foothold in the Chinese market. Add the crippling effects of the pandemic into the mix, and Samsung's Chinese venture morphed into a veritable quagmire of challenges and setbacks. Japan boosts subsidies to aid Japanese companies leaving China. Canon's decision to shut down its operations in Zhuhai, China, Zhuhai, China, serves as another blow to the region's economy. This departure isn't merely a business decision, it reverberates as a profound loss for the local community, amplifying concerns over dwindling tax revenue and job opportunities. The escalating labor costs in China have driven a steady stream of factories towards Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam and India, further deepening the economic downturn. Moreover, the waning demand for digital cameras, overshadowed by the dominance of smartphones, exacerbates the situation. As companies like Canon pull out, the ramifications are felt keenly by the local populace, many of whom had pinned their hopes on employment prospects within these factories. Now, faced with an uncertain future and dwindling opportunities, they find themselves navigating an increasingly challenging landscape of livelihoods and economic stability. Sony Corporation, a Fortune Global 500 company hailing from Japan, recently declared its withdrawal from the Chinese market. The move involves relocating its camera production lines, serving Japan, the US, and Europe, from China to Thailand sequentially. 
Renowned for its televisions and cameras, Sony also manufactures semiconductors, chips, and precision-sensing instruments. Despite initial success, Sony has faced a declining market share in China due to fierce competition from domestic brands. Consequently, the company has chosen to shift its entire production line to Thailand, focusing on electronic sensor manufacturing primarily for Western markets like Europe and the US. With a presence in China spanning 27 years, Sony initially focused on after-sales service before expanding into research, development, production, and sales. While once flourishing, Sony's withdrawal reflects deeper concerns beyond market competition. The ongoing decoupling between China and the US, especially in the semiconductor sector, poses significant challenges to Sony's Chinese operations, potentially disrupting supplies from the US. Thus, Sony's departure from China appears inevitable in the long run. Despite China's importance to manufacturing and labor-intensive industries, some argue that foreign companies like Sony may view it as dispensable, amidst a trend of continuous withdrawals and relocations to Southeast Asia. After more than four decades of establishment in China, Toshiba is pulling out of the nation, signifying another major Japanese firm reducing its footprint in China's business arena. The decision is prompted by Toshiba's struggle to sustain profitability amid rising production expenses and diminishing labor advantages in China. The shuttering of all 33 factories in China by December 2021 signals a transition of electrical operations to Vietnam and the repatriation of research hubs to Japan. This strategic shift stems from a combination of external and internal factors. Nikon and HP have recently declared the closure of various legal entities in China, while Foxconn has ramped up its investments in India. These developments have been interpreted as expressions of foreign enterprises' discontentment with the investment climate in China. Nikon's decision to initiate bankruptcy proceedings for its subsidiary in northeast China appears particularly baffling, given its instrumental role in revitalizing the area's aging industrial infrastructure. The subsidiary has been running at a loss for numerous years, exacerbated by pandemic-related challenges, thus making bankruptcy proceedings a seemingly pragmatic course of action. Conversely, HP's closure of multiple sales companies primarily stems from business re-engineering efforts. In a recent development, Bridgestone, Japan's largest tire manufacturer, shut down its Shenyang factory. The closure of Bridgestone's Shenyang facility in China has left 1,200 workers without jobs. On February 29, 2024, Bridgestone, a renowned tire manufacturer, ceased operations at its Shenyang plant, citing a downturn in the commercial tire market. Another foreign tire company followed suit, exacerbating the situation. With the closure of the factory, these workers are now confronted with unemployment and an uncertain future. The fate of the 1,200 employees hangs precariously, marking the demise of a period of prosperity for foreign businesses in China, particularly for Bridgestone, renowned for its robust welfare programs and job security. The repercussions for the tire industry are profound, signaling the end of an era characterized by a bitter legacy. China's Economic Turmoil and Global Rupture in 2024 the Chinese government's ambitious strategic plan, made in China 2025, has sparked significant controversy by aiming to position China as a global leader in high-tech manufacturing. This initiative, which relies heavily on government subsidies, state-owned enterprises, and aggressive intellectual property acquisition, seeks not only to narrow the technological gap with the West, but to surpass it entirely. While it charts a bold path toward technological self-sufficiency, Made in China 2025 has raised concerns in Western nations. Critics argue that the plan employs tactics such as forced technology transfers, intellectual property theft, and cyber espionage, undermining international trade norms and eroding the investment climate. Consequently, the United States and its allies are reconsidering their economic ties with China. In 2024, and the economic outlook still remains bleak, resembling the onset of a harsh winter. The closure of 460,000 businesses and deregistration of 3.1 million individual businesses in the first half of 2023 alone underscores the severity of the situation. The downturn is evident in decreased usage of popular platforms like Didi and Trip, 
reflecting financial strain on nearly 800 million individuals grappling with debt and 23 million facing unemployment in China. The influx of graduates into the job market exacerbates competition for limited opportunities, leading many to seek stability in civil service roles, with over 3 million applicants vying for positions in 2024. The wave of unemployment looms large. Even the European Union, known for its nuanced approach to China, is reassessing its relationship. The EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI, aimed at enhancing economic ties, faces obstacles, with the European Parliament halting its ratification. This shift signals growing skepticism within the EU regarding the benefits of engaging with China, fueled by Beijing's actions that increasingly clash with European values and interests, alongside its assertive stance on global issues. The declining trend, along with a reduction in the establishment of research and development centers by Fortune Global 500 firms in China since 2018, raises apprehensions regarding the nation's capacity to maintain foreign investment and its standing in high-tech industries. Despite China's assertions as the world's second-largest economy and primary manufacturing hub, its dependency on foreign corporations for production capacity and achievements in foreign trade is apparent. The departure of major multinational corporations prompts inquiries into China's capability to regulate its market and engage in autonomous competition across various sectors. Foreign capital has been steadily pulling out. Despite China unilaterally lifting visa restrictions on several countries, it has not only failed to draw a surge of foreigners into the country but has also witnessed a gradual decline in the number of foreigners who were previously residing in the country. This might be causing genuine concern for Xi Jinping. In recent months, China has streamlined visa procedures for business travelers and tourists, reduced visa fees, and even introduced visa waivers for select countries. Additionally, China has maintained its favorable tax policies to make living in China more appealing for foreign nationals. Physical stores are empty, wholesale markets are deserted, and even live streaming platforms have no viewers. So where has everyone gone? Many Chinese colleagues in the industry, whether veterans or newcomers, have never experienced such a disastrous march in the year 2024. It's truly unprecedented. Consumer spending on the mainland is simply appalling. We've interviewed many friends in the clothing industry, and they all feel helpless and miserable. They call this March of 2024 the Dark March, a catastrophe never seen before in this century. Even during the pandemic, when people were confined to their homes, things weren't this bad. Even the traditionally slow months like July and August were better than now. Clearly, you can feel that there are problems in the market. In over a decade, the banks haven't faced a situation like this year's. Now, if you randomly ask someone on the street, they all feel that there's an issue with the current market. People are reluctant to spend money, malls are empty, and markets are constantly closing down. Many storefronts are vacant, and even when available, they struggle to find tenants. Where have all these consumers gone? Over the past couple of years, the crowded shopping scenes have become rare. It seems like many people aren't keen on shopping or spending money anymore. They save wherever they can, and when they do have money, they prefer to save it rather than spend it, especially as earning becomes more difficult. In the past, many middle-class individuals looked down on platforms like Pinduoduo and never bought anything from there. But now, many companies are rallying together privately, asking each other to help negotiate prices. Previously, many people found this distasteful, but now they not only accept it but also see it as a good thing. Many used to take taxis everywhere, but now they've gotten used to taking public transportation. On the surface, it seems like there's nobody left, but the real feeling is that people just don't have money anymore. The poor performance of businesses and large-scale layoffs in the internet industry directly translate to pay cuts. Now, in supermarkets, vegetables and fruits are no longer priced by the kilogram. From what I remember, watermelons used to be sold by weight. A few days ago, I saw watermelons in the supermarket priced at over 83 cents per kilogram. You heard that right, over 83 cents for a small watermelon, which is outrageous. Many people can't afford watermelons anymore. In mainland China, 674 is considered expensive. These middle-class individuals earn just over $691 a month, averaging only a little over $13 a day. Now, if you go to the market to buy things or dine out, $13 simply isn't enough. So, this is the current situation. This is the market situation after the resumption of work. 
Is it difficult or not? It's difficult, yet we still have to pay fees. Today, I haven't even made $26 in sales. What national style, what style? Aren't they all nonsense? No matter what style it is, it can't withstand the market. If the market isn't strong, even the wind won't help. It's useless. Can everyone understand this year's business? Isn't it supposed to get busier after the resumption of work? Why are there fewer and fewer people? Hey, I haven't experienced such a market in spring for over a decade. Usually, what I experience is the market where everyone is using Bluetooth to wake up. Now, things are unclear. But I believe people have to eat, and they have to wear clothes. This is essential. Clothing is definitely eternal, the industry cannot do without clothes. With so many people in China, fellow traders, have I given you enough encouragement? Now, we feel powerless. No matter how much we adjust or innovate, there are no customers. It's utterly disheartening. In the past, if sales were slow, we could change styles or adjust prices, and business would improve. But now, no matter what we do, there's no one buying. How can we manage in such a situation? Some may hear optimistic predictions and think things will improve in the summer, but the reality is harsh. Even when summer arrives, the situation will likely remain the same. Maybe things will slightly improve in the fall and winter, but the first half of this year is essentially a write-off. This isn't fear-mongering, it's the reality we're facing. Feishu, a software office system under ByteDance, is reportedly conducting a large-scale layoff, affecting approximately 20% of its workforce, which will impact thousands of employees. In a report by the paper in Saishin, on March 26, the employees of Feishu received a company-wide message. In the message, the company stated, due to issues such as large team size, insufficient organization efficiency, decreased productivity, and lack of focus, the company has decided to make some adjustments and appropriately streamline the team size. Feishu peaked at 6,000 to 8,000 employees in 2022. On March 26 of this month, an informed source told 21st Century Economic Report that Feishu currently has about 5,000 employees, and the layoff ratio this time is 20%. For employees who are laid off, Feishu has provided compensation plans and job transfer opportunities. ByteDance Feishu officially announced. The layoffs are expected to affect a thousand people, as a company that promotes corporate office efficiency begins to address its own office efficiency issues. This round of layoffs has a unique and difficult to decipher significance, completely changing the algorithm for layoffs that was previously exclusive to the entire network. Previously, the so-called strategic and business announcements made by major companies during good economic times, which we believe to be the safest job prospects, are no longer secure. Feishu initially served as an internal communication tool for ByteDance. Since 2012, ByteDance has used various domestic and foreign office applications such as Skype, WeChat and WeChat Enterprise, Slack, and DingTalk. At the end of 2016, it decided to develop its own, and at the end of 2017, ByteDance began to use Feishu comprehensively, and it was officially open to the industry in 2019. In November 2021, ByteDance CEO Zhang Yiming announced the establishment of six business segments, namely Douyin, Dili Education, Feishu, Volcano Engine, Kaoxinyuan, and TikTok. Feishu's layoff of 20% can be seen how bad the IT environment is this year. So how should we deal with it? Hello everyone, I'm a programmer, and today I want to share with you a recent hot topic in the IT industry, which is Feishu's layoff of 20%. They actually have about 5,000 employees in total which means they are going to lay off around 1,000 people. According to internal sources, because I'd previously interviewed at Feishu through a referral from a colleague's classmate, he said their department indeed had such a layoff. At that time, I felt quite good during the interview, but they said they wouldn't consider me because there was already a candidate in the group who had a similar experience. Of course, I don't deny that there might be some issues with my skills, but it might also be due to the impact of this layoff. I had my interview two weeks ago, and about this layoff, I feel like the IT environment in 2024 is really tough. According to Interface News, starting from 2022, business lines such as Feishu and TikTok have received layoff notices. At the same time, Tencent has also reported layoffs. On March 27, a netizen posted a message on a workplace content community stating that according to internal messages from relevant employees, a certain major company has begun layoffs with a layoff ratio of 10% to 30%.
According to the Southern Metropolis Daily Report, the PCG and CSIG business groups mentioned in the message are all business groups under Tencent. However, Tencent insiders pointed out that the message was not true. However, Tencent has previously reported layoffs several times. According to reports from Fast Technology, Tencent's Q1 2023 financial report shows that as of March 31, 2022, Tencent had 116,213 employees. As of December 31, 2022, this number was 108,436, and as of March 31, 2023, this number dropped to 106,221. From the data, from March 31, 2022 to March 31, 2023, Tencent reduced its workforce by almost exactly 10,000 employees, a decrease of 8.6%. Pei Minxin, a professor of Chinese politics and issues, said that the Chinese government can reduce the alienation of Sino-Western relations by stabilizing the geopolitical tensions involving the country. However, considering the recent trend of economic decoupling, it is unlikely that the situation of talent outflow will be reversed. It's not just foreign business executives and tourists who feel that China has lost its charm. Even students from developed countries don't want to study in China anymore. Diplomats analyzed why China is no longer attractive to foreign students. According to a report by the People's Political Consultative Conference held this month, Professor Jia Qinghua of Peking University pointed out that the policies related to the study in China brand promoted by Xi Jinping seem to have not produced substantive results. The number of international students studying in China, especially from the United States, has decreased from its peak of about 15,000 students 10 years ago to about 350 students in 2023. Why has the number of international students decreased? Jia Qinghua listed three possible reasons. First is the perception issue. In short, foreign students generally believe that studying in China is not very meaningful. Additionally, obtaining funding from the Chinese Ministry of Education for studying in China is not only difficult, but also potentially dangerous. The second reason is that foreign companies have reduced their business operations in China due to the deterioration of the Chinese economy. This means that internships or similar opportunities for foreign students have decreased. The third reason is the ideological factor in China. There is increasing uncertainty about the anonymous review of papers written by foreign students. Additionally, the lack of detailed implementation guidelines for China's espionage law has made the standards for illegality unclear, leading to misunderstandings in China. It is currently unclear whether students from developed countries will choose to study in China again. If the Chinese government believes that despite crackdowns, foreigners and funds will still be attracted to China, then reality proves this wrong. Recently, Japanese media Kyoto News reported that a Chinese professor teaching at Kobe University in Japan disappeared after returning to Beijing in early March to visit family. At this moment, the number of people disappearing in China for reasons of national security, including those of foreign nationality, is increasing. Coupled with the decline in the Chinese economy, despite Xi Jinping's personal involvement, who dares to enter China either as a foreigner or with foreign funds, while Xi Jinping meets multinational CEOs in Beijing, in Hong Kong, 23 new measures are rapidly enacted, reflecting the characteristic mix of both CCP and Xi Jinping styles. However, for foreign businesses and investments that prioritize certainty, this creates uncertainty. At this moment, Hong Kong resembles Nanjing in 1949, with the Yangtze River surging, whether to stay or leave, becomes a question. Firstly, the Wall Street Journal observes the impact of the 23 measures from the perspective of Hong Kongers. The headline reads, Bookstores Closed, Shows Cancelled, Hong Kong Descends into Sad Silence. The report indicates that with China's authoritarian rule tightening its grip on this once bustling metropolis, every corner of society is affected. Bookstores are closing, shows are being cancelled, and the once rallying voices against the government now whisper behind closed doors. The recently enacted 23 measures impose harsher penalties for incitement-related offenses and introduce new charges related to state secrets and foreign interference. This legislation, swiftly passed by the Hong Kong Legislative Council with the approval of the Chinese government, has sparked debates about whether people will get into trouble for minor offenses. For instance, some wonder if keeping old pro-democracy newspapers scattered around the house might lead to trouble. The vice chairman of the Social Democratic Alliance, Chao Ka Fai, remarked that as more unwritten rules emerge, citizens become increasingly unsure of how to behave, forced to silently bear the burden. The Social Democratic Alliance is one of the few remaining pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong.
The police have urged taxi drivers to report anyone they suspect of being involved in violence, terrorism, or other crimes. They have also established a hotline for reporting national security-related information, receiving hundreds of thousands of messages so far. Several independent bookstores renowned for supporting freedom of speech have stated that they are subjected to frequent government inspections regarding various matters, including land use regulations and the clear display of business licenses. In the Hong Kong art scene, a series of dance and theater performances have been cancelled by organizers or venues, sometimes without explanation. Members participating in these performances are well-known pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Public funding for Hong Kong's oldest theater awards has also been reduced. The Financial Times analyzed how the 23 measures have affected the confidence of foreign businesspeople in Hong Kong. The report stated that in Hong Kong, the US-based law firm Reed Smith is preventing its lawyers from using international databases. Deloitte and KPMG require employees to carry disposable phones when visiting Hong Kong. Several other multinational companies are discussing whether to take similar measures. A consultant based in Hong Kong stated, there are so many uncertainties now. People are unsure what actions carry risks. In terms of data security, is Hong Kong considered part of China? No one knows. The recently enacted 23 measures aim to expand the definition of state secrets, including data related to the economic, social, or technological developments of Hong Kong or mainland China. A senior foreign banker remarked, In the past, people like me who were completely indifferent to politics always felt completely safe. I thought they would leave me alone because I wasn't involved in any political activities. But now I'm not so sure. Many companies in Hong Kong conduct due diligence. If one of them annoys someone, what will be the consequences? Recently, bankers have been asking whether foreign nationals in Hong Kong will face travel bans, similar to what some executives experience on the Chinese mainland, especially if they handle sensitive information about Chinese companies and due diligence projects. Stephen Roach, former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, wrote in an article for the Financial Times, Hong Kong is finished, and it saddens us. It took only a few years to destroy the Oriental Pearl built over a century. The 23 measures are the last straw that broke Hong Kong's back and probably the final blow to the confidence of foreign businesses and investments in China. Will foreign businesses buy into it? Leave your comments in the section below.